There's a relatively recent concept in the world of IT development called business rules. Business rules are fundamentally ways that are statements that drive the business and they are independent of technology. Things that the business community wants to decide they can do that might affect the applications, but they don't want to have to change the applications. Business rules concept says we're going to externalize the decisions. If I wanted to give a 10% discount to students who live in Florida, I wouldn't want to have to ask the developers to go in every time I decide, well, maybe 10% is too high, we should have it 9%, or it's too low, we should go to 15%. I would like to have the ability to make those changes on the fly. Business rules gives me that ability. Here's an example of a poorly formed business rule. So it's not well formed, but it gives you an example of the typical kinds of business rules that we deal with. If a customer's current debt load plus the credit request is greater than four times their gross income, so obviously we're dealing here with a customer buying something on credit and they already have a debt, then deny the request unless their credit is excellent and they've been on the same job for over five years. If this is the case, approve the request but require a cosigner. If the total new debt is less than four times their gross income and their credit is excellent or good, approve the request. If they only have good credit and have been on their current job less than five years, approve with a cosigner. Otherwise, reject the order. That's basically the kinds of things that we deal with when we're talking about business rules. Five years, four times gross income, those should not be constants. Those should be variables that the business community has the authority or somebody within the business community has the authority to adjust as the need arises. If I'm trying to develop now a test scenario to make sure that the new application is taking all of these conditions properly into account, just reading the text drives me nuts. I can't see all of the different possible combinations out of the text. Well, there's a wonderful tool called a decision table, which allows me to express complex combinations of conditions so that I can make sure that I am actually testing for those conditions or those sets of conditions that are relevant and I'm not wasting my time testing the same types of conditions or conditions that are irrelevant all the time. Now, the way a decision table is set up is a little bit uh, too much to teach in this, in this class. There are other courses out online available for how to create a decision table. We're going to assume that you have that ability or if you don't have it, that you can get the uh, courses, have access to the courses to, to create one. What we're interested in is using the decision table to come up with test scenarios. The decision table fundamentally lists all the conditions at the top. In this case, they're shaded in blue. And it can li uh, lists all of the actions that might come or the outcome out of the combinations of conditions at the bottom in green. So if you looked at the first column, you can see we're identifying a scenario in that column in which the debt is greater than four times the gross income, you've been on the job for more than five years, and your credit is excellent. All three of those conditions are met. Then, at the, you can see in the lower half, we're going to approve that uh, request and, however, request a cosigner. If the debt is greater than four times the income, but your credit is not excellent, we don't care if you've been on the job for more than five years. If your credit is not excellent, we're going to deny the request. We're not trying to get into a discussion about how good these rules are. All we are saying is these seven conditions, or these seven combinations of conditions up here, each of them represents a legitimate potential set of conditions that is going to lead to some kind of an action. Those conditions up above that are blank, what we are saying with that is they are irrelevant for this particular set of conditions. As an example, there's only one column in which the credit good is relevant, and that is if your debt is not greater than four times your gross income, you have been on the job for over five years, and your credit is not excellent, but it is good, which would be good enough. That's an example of a decision table. If I want to get from the decision table to test scenarios, they're there. All I would have to do is, given the, the test scenario first column, I could write that as given that your debt is greater than four times your gross income and you have been on the job for more than five years and your credit is excellent, then approve the request and request a cosigner. The next test scenario would say if your debt is greater than four times gross income and your credit is not excellent, then deny the request. Third column, if your debt is greater than four times gross income and you have not been on the job for more than five years, then deny the request. So you can see every column is a test scenario. Now, in order to absolutely prove 
that the application is working correctly, of course, I have to get into those boundary values and equivalence classes. So that four times gross income, I'm going to take some value that is one less than four times gross income, exactly four times gross income, one more than four times gross income. That's that boundary value uh, testing. I'm going to have to set up test data. There's going to be a test scenario outline for each of these columns, which will then uh, reference example tables that contain multiple data case, uh, test cases with specific data values. That's really how you get from a very powerful tool called a decision table down to test scenarios. The beauty of this is quite often the people who are, who are uh, writing the requirements or the developers themselves will create a decision table just to help them make sure that they have all of their bases covered. So you may not even have to be the one creating the table, but if there is a decision table around, it's a phenomenal tool for coming up with test scenarios. A use case is another phenomenal tool for getting test scenarios. Again, there's going to be a very simple transition, assuming you have a use case of a proposed application to get to the test scenarios that you need to prove that it's working correctly. Now, again, just like with the decision tables, use cases is a little too complex to try to teach all of that in, in relationship to this particular class. So we are assuming that you either know what a use case is, at least have a good feeling for what should be in it, or you can go online and get other courses in building uh, use cases, what a, how to create a use case. Fundamentally, just to give you the bare bones, a use case describes a trigger which causes the use case to uh, become active. It lists the uh, actors or the people or other applications that are involved in the use case. It has obviously a description, a, a very brief description, which is really about the business value that this use case provides. And then, it has a listing of all of the preconditions, which are situations that have to be true uh, or conditions that have to be met before this use case can, uh, can work. A standard path, which is under normal circumstances, the sequence of events that are going to happen, the interactions that are going to happen with this use case. Post conditions are the conditions that are met or that will be created by the use case concluding successfully. Alternate paths as opposed to the standard path, which is the normal way, alternate paths are different ways of getting to the same outcome. An alternate path, although it is going to do things a little differently than the standard path, is always going to create the same post condition. The exception paths are an exception to that. Basically, an exception path is if there are cert uh, certain things happen while the use case is being performed that cause the use case to not be able to complete successfully. So exception paths will always have a different post condition than the standard path and the alternative paths. Well, an easy way to think about it, in my opinion, is an alternate path always returns to the standard path and will ultimately end up in the same post condition, whereas an exception will not return to the standard path and therefore it will have a different post condition. There are other things that might be included in a use case document, such as measures, metrics, how many, how often, how many users are there involved and things like that. They, those would all become part of what are called non-functional requirements that we'll address a little later on. Right now, if I'm looking at this use case document, and if I actually had one, give you an example of one, uh, I would be able to identify positive tests, which are really going to prove that the standard path works, that every alternate path works and delivers the same post condition as the standard path, and that each exception path is recognized and delivers an appropriate post condition that is different than the standard path. If I'm looking at the negative test that I can identify using a use case, I'm going to try to find ways of making sure that the preconditions are not met. Make sure that the application can deal with rejecting illegitimate or illegal preconditions. And I'm going to have to also prove that given the correct preconditions and following the correct paths, anything that I can do to try to make the post conditions incorrect, meaning to create a post condition that the application should not be producing. So negative tests are trying to break the use case. Positive tests are trying to confirm that it was correctly implemented. So an example of a use case we have here, it's a very simple example. Obviously, they can get a whole lot more complex than this. But ultimately, at this level of detail, especially in an agile environment, we're really trying to keep it down to a very simple level because remember, user stories are something that a developer should be able to create in a day or two. Well, if they have a use case of a user story, then it should be simple enough that they can use that as a guideline 
for completing that. The example we're going to use here is insurance, automobile insurance, a user's canceling coverage. The preconditions, customer has to have an account in order to be able to have a policy. They're logging in, system displays the menu. You can see here the use case is fundamentally a dialogue between an actor, in this case the customer, and the application, or in this case what we're calling the system. Every use case shows interaction between two or more entities. So it's always going to follow this dialogue kind of a structure. System displays the menu, customer selects view active policies. System displays the active policies, the customer selects the policy they would like to cancel and chooses the cancel action, system requests confirmation. Customer confirms, system cancels the policy, notifies underwriting, the system displays the menu and the customer logs off. That's a very simple example of a standard path. You'll notice the standard path is numbered sequentially because in a use case, the uh, use case is going to be executed step for step from the top to the bottom in a sequential manner. You can also see a couple of alternate paths that we've identified here. A101, when the customer is trying to uh, select a policy, the system displays no active policies. You don't have anything active right now. And then it goes back to step two, display the menu. Basically, what you can see here is the example of a very simplistic use case. Just by reading that text and that use case, reading the interaction, I can identify a bunch of test scenarios. One, customer in good standing with an active policy and no outstanding balance wants to cancel a policy. Obviously, the, outcome, the expected outcome there is it would run through. They should be able to cancel the policy with no problem. Two, customer has no active policies. I would expect that alternate path to kick in and show up that says no active policies available. Three, the customer has a policy with an overdue amount. I'm going to have to go through there and figure out what would be the consequences of that. How would the system react? What we're trying to demonstrate here is that you can, by just reading a use case, instantly pick up on a lot of different test scenarios. Actually, every step of the path in a use case, I would start to try to think of what could I test to prove that that particular step is correct? What can I do to break it? What can I do to fi figure out how I could make the system do something unanticipated, which would result in an error? Use cases deliver test scenarios, which you then express as test cases with engineered test data in given when-then format.